Hello, I'm James Ivers, and I'm here to tell you about the Untangling the Knot Research Project. In this project, we've been focusing on automation that can help us speed the pace at which we evolve our software to meet new needs. We all know that all of the systems that we build today are terribly reliant on software, increasingly so, it seems. And our ability to deploy capabilities more quickly to the field depends on how quickly we can make changes in that software. We also know from decades of experience here at the SEI that software architecture is a critical element of making that successful. The degree to which our architecture is well aligned with what the system needs to do means that we can make those changes more cost effectively and more quickly. We also know, however, that that architecture has to be realized in code because that's the artifact that development teams are actually changing. And again, if that code is well aligned with the architecture, which is well aligned with the need, then we can make changes quickly in response to the changing needs. And those changing needs are inevitable. Uh, we know that any successful system is going to last for many years, decades even. And over time, we're going to ask that software to do more and more. We're going to ask it to respond to new requirements, interact with new systems, deploy to new environments. All of this essentially puts many pressures on a system. We know that as we ask it to do more and more, the design that we want often tends to drift away from the design that was first built into that system. And some of the changes that we put in code might actually pull it in a completely opposite direction. In fact, this seems to be a fairly common phenomenon. This gap tends to emerge between the structure that we have and the structure that we want. And the larger that gap gets, the harder it is to make changes in that software. And we'll sometimes get to the point where uh, we'll think of it as a legacy system, which we really can't change anymore without some kind of radical improvement. Our ability to change software to reduce the size of this gap is what allows us to continue to keep pace with changing needs. And we see this over and over again. There are many common changes organizations around the world make all the time. We're adapting our software to host it on different platforms. We're trying to pull out a common capability so it can be used as a shared asset across multiple products. We want to break our legacy monoliths into more modular code, perhaps to deploy in the cloud or as part of a microservice architecture. All of these real world challenges are terribly common, and yet the structure of our software is a barrier to achieving them. In particular, we've identified a common technical problem we call the software isolation problem. That is, to accomplish any of these goals, you have to first isolate the software implementing a capability from all the software around it. And the way software becomes entangled in practice, that can be a really daunting exercise. Now, there is hope. Uh, and in fact, there is a rich body of knowledge called refactoring that promises to help. Refactoring has been a popular concept since the 90s. It's basically a set of techniques for changing the structure of our software without changing its behavior. Exactly what we want when we're trying to clean up something or to change that structure to better match what we need. However, despite its popularity, it remains a very labor-intensive activity, right? When you're thinking about a system that's more than a million lines of code, rooting through all of that to figure out where to make changes is time-consuming. Once you find where changes are needed, figure out which of dozens of well-known refactorings to apply to meet your needs also takes time. And then, of course, once you've done all this, this thought work, you actually have to make those changes in code. So there is hope uh, and there is automation that supports elements of this, but it's not as much as we would like, right? The strongest support tends to be in this bottom category where many modern integrated development environments actually support implementing a refactoring as directed by a user. That is, if a developer first figures out where to make a change and what to do, they can tell the tool to, to go through and make the code changes to realize that change. However, there are very few tools that actually recommend how to refactor source code. And most of those are oriented towards solving general code quality problems, dealing with code smells. So these are tools that can recommend how to reduce your overall coupling cut counts and so forth. But none of these really address that software isolation problem directly, because to solve that problem, you can't just focus on any random change around a code base. You have to focus on the issues that really matter to isolating that particular capability. So we've done some work over the past year uh, to understand how practitioners do large-scale refactoring today. Anecdotally, we've seen lots of problems here. We wanted to see how widespread this was. The results largely reinforced what we thought. So 
for purposes of the survey, we said large scale refactoring was you know, really big architecture scale change that affects you know, maybe more than 10,000 lines of code. So we asked developers, have you ever done this in your work experience? And only 18% said they've never done it. If you look at those who've done it two or more times, it's more than 60% of the population. So this is a common challenge that developers do have to face. And the size of the systems they've reported working on, if you take these top three categories, 100,000 lines of code or more, that's more than 70% of the respondents to our survey. So they're commonly having to deal with these large problems, uh, but without all the tools that they really would want. Similarly, we asked them how often would they want to, or have they ever wanted to perform large-scale refactoring, but been unable to do so. And here again, the vast majority, 70%, said yes, they had wanted to. We asked further, why not? What, what got in your way? And the reasons that we heard from the survey match very much what we've heard in our experiences over the years. The top reason was new features were prioritized over refactoring, or the cost was too high, or it's too disruptive to other efforts. I bet most of these reasons sound familiar to you. But when you step back and really look at it, these boil down to three really common factors. We don't have the people to do it. We don't have the funds to do it. We don't have the time to do it. And ideally, automation can really tackle all of these by reducing the cost, reducing the time that's required, reducing the human capital that's required from your critical development staff to make these kinds of changes. So we also asked, how do they use tools for large scale refactoring today? And unfortunately, what we saw was the majority of the tools cited fell into very general categories. General purpose development environments like uh, Eclipse and Visual Studio dominate. Um, there were only a few uses of tools that actually support how to find where to refactor code. And more of those were of the weaker variety that provided uh, less specific recommendations. And finally, the, the portion of tools that were really oriented towards solving refactoring problems were used by very few of the respondents. So clearly, there's room for improvement here. And this is exactly the problem we've been trying to solve in our Untangling the Knot research project. Our goal has been to create a refactoring assistant that helps solve this software isolation problem. And if you think about this from a black box perspective, it needs two inputs to work. It needs a code base. You've already got that laying around. That's the easy part. It needs some notion of the goal you're trying to solve. And for us, that is what is that piece of software you're trying to isolate from everything around it. Given those two things, we have developed a prototype that will do all the work that's currently manually in terms of finding where to do refactorings and which refactorings to apply. And it will generate a very concrete set of recommendations. If you do these 18, 50, 120 things, depending on the size of your problem, this will solve most of your problem for you. And the aspiration here is that if a refactoring assistant can provide this kind of help to a development team, they can cut the time that's required to perform software isolation to less than a third of what it takes today. And that's really, really powerful. We have data from one government example where a contractor estimated that the cost just to isolate software was more than 14,000 development hours. Imagine being able to cut that down to less than 5,000. Savings of more than 9,000 development hours by running a tool. This is the potential that we're going after with this research. So the key concept here is something that we drew from our own experience as software architects uh, and those who've done code, software code analysis in the past. And that is the understanding that we can take a look at software in a way to focus on this problem. So this, this lovely picture on the left here is a graph representation of a small piece of open source software. It's only about 70,000 lines of code. Within this picture, what we have are nodes that represent the key structural elements, classes and interfaces and methods and things like this, as well as all the dependencies that exist in the source code among these things. So a method calls another method, a class inherits from another class, these sorts of things. So what we know is when we apply some semantic understanding to this graph, we can really start to make some sense and really focus our attention. Specifically, if we annotate a portion of the graph, let's say this cluster in the upper left, and say this is the software we're trying to isolate from everything around it. Now, now we have some insight. We know that there is a key concept, problematic couplings, that's going to help us solve this problem. That comes from the observation that not all the dependencies in this graph are relevant to solving that problem. 
What we care about, the red lines in this graph, which are those problematic couplings, are the dependencies from the software we're trying to isolate to software that is outside of that context. These are the things that are going to break if we try and pull that software out and deploy it in its own container, for example. The wonderful thing about this is this is an enumerable thing. We can count it. In fact, we can count it very, very efficiency, efficiently. Um, and this allows us to take this general amorphous problem, isolate this software for me, and turn it into a very concrete problem. Uh, this is now an optimization problem. We're trying to reduce that number of problematic couplings. So by reframing the software engineering problem as an optimization problem, there's a whole class of algorithms we can apply to search automatically for solutions to that problem. And that's exactly what we've done in this research. Our refactoring assistant is based around a core search algorithm, which is a multi-objective genetic algorithm based on the popular NSGA2 algorithm. It has three key elements that make it successful. One is it has a representation of the code structure that we're trying to analyze. We've used static code analysis to build an intermediate representation, like the graph that I just showed you, of the key structural elements and relations. Over this graph, we have formalized more than a dozen Fowler-style refactorings. Each of these you can think of as an operation on that graph. If I apply this refactoring to this piece of code, here's how it changes the graph. This gives us a tool to apply lots and lots of changes to the graph without actually having to change source code. Finally, we have a growing collection of fitness functions, each of which is a measure of goodness for some criterion. So, for example, our core isolation problem is framed in terms of problematic couplings. A problematic coupling count is a fitness function for which minimization, reducing the number of problematic couplings, represents a better solution than another. So our search algorithm integrates these elements to automatically search thousands and thousands of combinations of different refactorings applied to different points in code and measures the relative goodness against one or more objectives to come up with recommendations for a development team who's trying to perform software isolation. In practice, we're easily solving more than 80% of the problems with this technique today, and we see potential for further improvements. So I do want to touch on the notion of multi-objective because this is a really important concept and a really good fit to, to the nature of the problem that we're solving. In software development, we're almost always having to deal with some kind of trade-off decision. I want more performance, but I don't want to give up security is a, a familiar example. So multi-objective algorithms allow us to search for solutions that balance different, uh, different objectives in different ways, and they generate what is called a set of Pareto optimal solutions, as illustrated in this picture. So in this picture, I have two objectives. One is problematic couplings, lower is better. The other is the size of the code, measured in lines of code, that is going to be in that isolated feature. Again, lower is generally better. So instead of generating a single solution, a multi-objective algorithm is going to generate a range of comparable solutions. No point on this solution is clearly better than any other because no objective is clearly better than any other. This gives developers choice. Each of these solutions represents different trade-offs among these two objectives and different development teams might choose different points on that curve for their action. Many might go for the compromise solution that solves more than three quarters of the problem while not adding a whole lot of code. Others might be unconcerned with adding code and just want to solve as much of the problem as they possibly can. We're not presupposing which of those trade-offs is most appropriate for any development team. We're giving them that choice and that power to make those decisions. And that's one of the strengths of this approach. Stepping back to looking at the tool from that black box perspective. As input, it takes a source code. It takes a code base. Uh, we've run it on more than a million lines of code so far with no difficulty. It takes some user specification of the code that we're trying to isolate. In practice, this is something a development team can write down in an hour or two's time. This is not a heavy lift. Then there's a selection of which set of objectives we want to optimize for. Problematic couplings is a default right now because that is the core of the isolation problem, but there could be other changes that have to do with uh, minimizing code change, uh, maximizing code quality. There's a range of options you can choose from. And again, context specific might value different options. But once you've made these selections, the tool takes over. It goes through, it runs through these thousands and thousands of combinations uh, across many generations in the genetic algorithm and generates a Pareto front from which a development team can choose and inspect each individual solution for applicability to their purposes. 
Now, these solutions are really concrete things. Uh, as the left illustrates, it's uh, just the beginning of one, actually. It is a step-by-step -step instruction manual. Do step one, then step two. One of the strengths of this is that each of these steps is independently reviewable and independently selectable for the most part. Uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. But this gives a very clear set of steps that can be evaluated. It solves the which refactorings we apply because each step clearly identifies what work is being done. Many of these are in fact refactorings that are supported in today's integrated development environments, making the implementation of these recommendations even easier. The vocabulary comes from published books and websites where you can look up the meaning and additional context for what each of these mean. Moreover, each, is, each refactoring in the solution is supplied with a set of parameters that make it really, really specific, right? Which class are you moving into where? Which method are you moving into where? If you're extracting elements of a class to form a new class, what are the specific elements to be extracted? This again makes it very, very clear what the tool is recommending and what a development team can evaluate. Finally, there are secondary changes that are implied by some of these refactorings. We make those explicit. If you need to change the visibility of something uh, or to uh, change the, the reference uh, to get to a new location, that's called out specifically by the tool. So again, this is providing very actionable recommendations that a development team can review. And the power of this from a time and cost savings perspective is that now your development teams are reviewing a set of specific recommendations to say, yes, that makes sense. No, it doesn't. Instead of doing all the search on their own, they're not rooting through a million lines of code to figure out where to look. Our tool is pointing them at where to look and recommending what specific changes will help them achieve their goals. And that's why it's an assistant. Um, our results to date are really really something that we're proud of. We beat our goals in our two key measures, which we call solution completeness and solution quality. Solution completeness is essentially a measure of how much, how many of those problematic couplings can we eliminate in practice. So from looking across 14 open source code bases, um, you see that our mean problematic coupling reduction is, is nearly 88%. Uh, so that means for most applications, we can solve the vast majority of the problem for you. There are still some outliers, and we're looking through the data on this because we know that we're not done yet. There are some refactors we haven't implemented yet, and I have every reason to believe we'll push those numbers even higher over time. But solution quality is the thornier issue because while we can mathematically solve a big portion of the problem, the other question is will developers use those solutions? Will they find them acceptable? And that's what we've been measuring under the, the heading of solution quality. So here we've done a few smaller scale uh, tests with uh, three or four developers and handed them recommendations generated by the tool and asked them step by step, would you apply this refactoring? Does this make sense? And the data to date shows that almost 85% of what the tool is generating is a recommendation that they would apply in code today. Now again, there's more research to do here. We've got some great feedback from this exercise to help us refine what some of the refactorings do and some of the fitness functions we use to guide search towards more and more acceptable solutions. But already, uh, with a TRL4 prototype, we're solving a huge portion of the problem in a way that is predominantly acceptable to developers, and these numbers will only go up over time. So this is a, a wonderful success. But a quick note on scalability. This is an incredibly practical solution. Um, all of the data that we're presenting runs on a developer's laptop in under three hours. So this is an exercise, again, scaling more, to a mil more than a million lines of code on a development laptop, no special hardware, a job that can run overnight and give a development team clean recommendations the next morning. This means any team can use this. And that is, again, really helpful. So to step back, we are three years into this research. We've got a lot of really good data showing the practicality of this. Our next push as we continue this research is to scale up and to scale into more and more practical settings. To date, all of our work has been done on C-sharp source code. Our next step is Java, and we're thinking that early January or early 2022, January, February timeframe, we should have a version of the refactoring assistant that can work on either C-sharp or Java code. So this will open up many more code bases for us to help out with. Uh, there are a number of technical concepts that we're working in to accommodate some real, uh, real world concerns, right? So constraint mechanisms are uh, something that we're going to add to a deal with 
uh, some common developer preferences. So for example, a development team might like to say, I want to treat this library as a whole. I don't want you to take pieces and parts and refactor the library. Treat it as a black box. We can introduce that as a constraint to steer the algorithm towards more acceptable solutions from the get-go once we add a way to accommodate or specify those preferences up front. So that'll be a nice practical addition. On the end use side, uh, currently the algorithm generates these Pareto front of solutions, and each solution can again be 100 or more refactorings for the larger problems that we're tackling. There are ways that we can simplify navigation of this data by taking, uh, taking into account a refactoring dependency theory we've developed together with our collaborator from the University of Michigan to help consolidate information that really needs to be related. So the simple example in this case is these three refactorings in a solution all depend on first doing that one. So if you're going to say no to that one, you're saying no to all of them. We can make that much more transparent. On the back end, we can also use this dependency theory to speed algorithm convergence in a way that's not terribly visible to the user, but will improve the quality of the results. So stepping way back, we've observed over and over again that this gap between the structure that you have and the structure that you want in software happens. It's, it's almost like an entropic effect over time. Organizations need ways to solve this more effectively. And what we're hoping is with the use of AI techniques to solve software engineering problems, we can help bend that cost curve for sustainment organizations or any organization wanting to involve, evolve their software over time. Because with a tool like the Knot, we can dramatically reduce the cost that it takes to bring your code closer into alignment with the structure that you need to allow you to continue to innovate in feature space. So with that, I'd like to open the floor to questions, but also a request for, for interaction. If any of you out there have code that you think would be a good fit and has a problem for which the knot could solve, please reach out to us. Let's see if we can have a conversation about what we might be able to do to help or learn more about your problem. Uh, this kind of research is very reliant on source code and we're always looking for really good case studies to help further mature the technology and get it out into practice. And with that, I believe we're ready for questions.